You're listening to the Anesthesia Patient Safety Podcast, the official podcast of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. We're bringing you the very best from the APSF newsletter and website, as well as the latest information in perioperative patient safety. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to the Anesthesia Patient Safety Podcast. My name is Allie Bechtel, and I'm your host. Thank you for joining us for another show. Today on the show, we are going to have a very important discussion, so I need you all to pay attention like someone's life depends on it. Wait, what's that? It's hard to pay attention with all these alarms? Are these important alarms? Are they false alarms? Okay, that's better. Where were we? Today, we are going to talk about a very important topic, and our patients' lives are at stake because we are talking about alarm fatigue and patient safety. Before we dive into today's episode, we'd like to recognize Medtronic, a major corporate supporter of APSF. Medtronic has generously provided unrestricted support as well as research and educational grants to further our vision that no one shall be harmed by anesthesia care. Thank you, Medtronic. We wouldn't be able to do all that we do without you. And now, if you are near your computer, we hope that you will check out APSF.org and click on the newsletter heading. The fourth one down is the newsletter archives, and then you can click on the June 2019 issue. Alarm Fatigue and Patient Safety by Peith Ruskin and James Bliss is the first featured article. So let's check it out. This topic was requested by several of our Twitter followers as well. Thank you for the great suggestion. We have come a long way from paper charting and manual blood pressure measurements in the operating room. Electronic medical devices provide monitoring, charting, and life support and have improved patient safety throughout the hospital. Each of these devices may have different audible and visual alerts and alarms whenever there is a change from the normal physiological parameters as an early warning for clinicians so that action can be taken before a patient is harmed. Another type of alarm is a device function alarm that is intended to alert healthcare providers about device malfunction or failure. These alarms are absolutely essential for life support devices such as ventilators and cardiopulmonary bypass machines. In the clinical setting, and especially in areas of high acuity such as the operating room and the intensive care unit, there is a high frequency of alarms. Studies have been done in this area. In one study, almost 9,000 alarms occurred during 25 consecutive procedures, and 359 alarms occurred during each procedure, which ended up being about 1.2 alarms each minute of the procedure. One explanation for the high frequency of alarms is that equipment manufacturers set alarm defaults to a high sensitivity to prevent missing true events, but as a result, many alarms have a low specificity and low positive predictive value and are often silenced or ignored. In addition, there are alarms for so many different parameters that the result is often a loud and potentially distracting clinical care area that may compromise patient safety. Alarm fatigue is defined as an increase in a healthcare provider's response time or a decrease in his or her response rate to an alarm as a result of experiencing excessive alarms. This is not unique to medicine and may occur in other professions as well, such as transportation. When there is such a high frequency of alarms, false and real, the professionals may ignore or actively silence the alarms in order to continue their work. Alarm fatigue has led to medical accidents and patient harm, and the Joint Commission made clinical alarm management a national patient safety goal. Alarm fatigue also falls into two of APSF's perioperative patient safety priorities related to preventing, detecting, and mitigating clinical deterioration in the perioperative period and distractions in procedural areas. Let's look a little closer at the research into excessive alarms. 
Bliss and Gilson created an early taxonomy of signaling terms, taking into consideration the time between the signal and the associated situation. Signal refers to all stimuli that function as a general emergency notification. More specifically, alarm is defined as a transient sensory signal that may be auditory or visual in the face of a specific danger that requires an immediate action to correct it. An alert refers to a signal for an adverse event that may occur in the future. The purpose of the alert is to give the operator more time to react in order to prevent a problem from occurring, while by the time the alarm sounds, the patient is in danger and needs corrective action immediately. There is a current standard for medical alarms, IEC 60601-1-8 that addresses basic safety and performance requirements with alarm categories that are prioritized by degree of urgency and consistency of alarm signals. This standard does not report on high sensitivity of alarm settings and the resultant low specificity. The goal for a medical alarm is to give the healthcare professional ample time to act to prevent an adverse outcome. Let's look at a couple more definitions. Clinical alarms refer to a signal that the patient needs immediate attention, and technical alarms refer to a signal that the biomedical equipment needs attention. For example, if the EKG displays ventricular fibrillation, this will lead to a clinical alarm. But if the EKG is inadvertently disconnected, this may lead to a technical alarm. The authors report on another taxonomy of alarms by Xiao and Siegel for medical professionals monitoring clinical situations. I will include this table in the show notes as well. False alarms occur when there is no danger and are often the result of low sensor thresholds. Nuisance alarms occur when there may be a problem in a specific context, but the alarm is activated for a different reason that does not indicate patient danger. Inopportune alarms occur at the wrong time, such as for a condition that may occur far in the future. These alarms must be distinguished quickly from actionable alarms that occur when there is a physiological change in the patient's condition that requires immediate action by the anesthesia professional, whether it is increased monitoring for a mild deviation or medication administration or initiating CPR for a life-threatening problem. Other alarms may occur that are non-actionable alarms in the setting of a monitoring artifact from skin prepping or electrocautery, or a true deviation during a clinically insignificant abnormality, such as holding ventilation at the surgeon's request and hearing the ventilator apnea alarm. With all this talk about different alarms and opportunities for false alarms, it is no wonder that alarm fatigue may occur, and we are going to review this important topic now. Remember, alarm fatigue occurs when there is failure to respond to an alarm, and this may lead to patient harm, and it has led to patient harm. The U.S. FDA reported more than 500 alarm-related patient deaths over a five-year time period. This is an important area for improved patient safety, and research has shown that improved alarm and alert design can lead to improved patient safety. It is a complicated area since we need alarms that are attention-grabbing in order to alert providers that an abnormal event has occurred, but when there are many non-actionable attention-grabbing alarms, this leads to the cry-wolf effect. The cry-wolf effect is when healthcare providers become desensitized to frequent false alarms, and this is more likely to occur during periods of high workload when providers mistrust or ignore subsequent alarms from the same or similar devices. Alarms are often loud, right? They have to be to grab your attention, but loud and intrusive auditory alarms may lead to increased stress levels for the healthcare providers, especially at night, and may affect patients, leading to poor sleep in the hospital and increased ICU delirium. Ruskin defined the term alarm flood to refer to the large number of alarms, which may even be from different patient care areas. The scope of the problem of alarm fatigue is immense, and the solution will also be complex. 
The authors write that the overarching goals for a comprehensive solution to alarm fatigue should be to clearly and accurately indicate potential hazards while minimizing false or nuisance alarms. There are several areas for potential solutions, including organizational aspects of the patient care area and layout, workflow and processes, and safety culture. There are things that we can do right now to help minimize the negative consequences from alarm fatigue with technical and engineering solutions, workload considerations, and practical changes to the way we use technology and ultimately, these changes will lead to new initiatives in training, clinical workflow, and organizational policies. One simple solution is consistent signaling across all equipment in the healthcare environment. In addition, it is important to minimize distractions due to noise, lighting, competing task demands, distrust, and unintentional blindness or deafness. New medical equipment should be designed to decrease the clinician's workload so that they can respond to alarms and alerts in a timely fashion. Another solution that the authors propose involves changes to the alarm processing algorithms of our physiologic monitors to minimize the number of non-actionable alarms. For example, delaying alarm activation for short and clinically irrelevant time periods due to minor violations can improve alarm reliability. This delayed alarm activation has been shown to decrease false alarms by 74% and values return to within normal limits without clinician action before alarm activation. Improving alarm design may also be a good idea for machine learning to simultaneously look at multiple parameters and minimize false alarms and improve alarm accuracy. There is definitely room for improved medical equipment monitoring design to increase the positive predictive value of clinical alarms, leading to decreased false alarms and mitigating alarm fatigue. What if we look at the sound of the alarm itself? Historically, it was thought that alarms needed to be loud if operators were going to notice them and respond in a timely manner. A recent study on alarm volume by Schlesinger and colleagues reported that physicians were able to distinguish alarms that were below the ambient noise level. The benefit of decreased alarm volume for non-life-threatening alarms is to lower the overall noise in the clinical environment. Is there anything that we can do in pa anesthesia patient care areas right now with regards to alarm fatigue? It is important to use appropriate alarm limits for each patient rather than just the default clinical settings and disable non-essential alarms. This can decrease the perceived workload and help to improve alarm accuracy, operator's experience, and overall satisfaction. Some specific examples include using pediatric profiles for pediatric cases or using the PACE mode for the EKG in a patient with a pacemaker. Another solution to decrease false alarms from artifact is to replace disposable sensors when they need to be repositioned, such as pulse oximeters or electrodes. Finally, it is important to use the appropriate monitors for each patient to avoid over-monitoring and the resultant increased number of alarms. Alarm fatigue is an important consideration for patient safety during anesthesia care. Going forward, we can take some simple steps in the OR to minimize false and non-actionable alarms. In addition, this promises to be an exciting area for innovation with medical equipment manufacturers developing alarm processing algorithms to improve alarm accuracy and minimize alarm fatigue. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us today on this journey towards improved patient safety. If you have any questions or comments from today's show, please email us at podcast at apsf.org. Visit apsf.org for detailed information and check out the show notes for links to all the topics we discussed today. Plus, you can find us on Twitter at apsf.org. Follow along with us for additional patient safety information tweets. If you are enjoying listening to this podcast, please rate us and leave us a review. We are so excited to continue to grow our Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation family. Until next time, stay vigilant so that no one shall be harmed by anesthesia care.